And the speaker is uh, Surab Kadakodi, is a research scientist at Google working on with Sturgeon Analytics team. Uh, his research inter interests are reliability and performance in the local file system and distributed persistence. And he earned his PhD from CMD. Hello. My name is Saurabh Kadekodi, and I'm here to present a highlights talk on Pacemaker, avoiding heart attacks in cluster storage systems with disk adaptive redundancy. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk at Sistar. Uh, this was a work that was originally presented at USENIX OSTI 2020, and it's a part of a larger body of work called Disk Adaptive Redundancy, or DARE and I encourage you to check it out if you haven't. I'm currently a research scientist at Google, but uh, this work was as, done as a part of my PhD, which was done at uh, Carnegie Mellon University's Parallel Data Laboratory. I'll start by giving some background. So today's storage clusters have hundreds of thousands of disks, hard disk drives in their primary storage tier, and they look something like this. So cluster storage systems or storage clusters are nothing but the storage subsystem of distributed systems. They have thousands to millions of hard disk drives. And at such scales, failures are extremely common. Disk failures are typically measured in terms of annualized failure rate, which is nothing but the expected percentage of disk failures in a given year. To protect against data loss in the face of uh, disk failures, the commonly employed technique is data redundancy. Here I show three-way replication, which is three copies of the data, or a six of nine erasure code, which has six data and three parities. So replication and erasure encoding are the commonly used mechanisms. I'll give a small, I'll take a small detour and give a primer on erasure coding. So erasure coding is the more space efficient redundancy alternative of replication. Denoted as a K of N scheme, it consists of K data chunks and N minus K parity chunks to form an N chunk stripe. All the chunks are typically are of the same size, a few megabytes. And whenever a disk fails or a chunk fails, it's, it is reconstructed by using any K of the N chunks. The storage overhead of an erasure coding scheme uh, is defined as the ratio N over K. And the reliability provided by a scheme is directly proportional to its storage overhead. So here I show two examples, a three of five scheme with an overhead of 1.66 and a six of nine scheme with an overhead of 1.5. And in this case, the three of five erasure encoding scheme has higher reliability compared to six of nine. Today, bulk of the data in large scale storage clusters is erasure encoded. An important assumption made when uh, performing these redundancy schemes uh, uh, is that all data fails similarly. I'm uh, sorry, all disks fail similarly. So even though multiple types of schemes may be used in the cluster, uh, all of them are unaware that underlying disk failure rates actually can vary. So the reality is data disks do not actually all fail similarly. In this toy example, I have disks from three make send models, blue, green, and yellow. Uh, here, let's consider that the green disks are the most reliable followed by the blue and the yellow are the weakest. So here I show two six of nine schemes where the top scheme has more of the yellow disks on which the data is striped and the bottom scheme has more disks of green and blue. A typical storage cluster has multiple makes and models. And the result of that is that in this example, these two stripes, even though they have the same configuration, actually provide different reliability. So the top stripe is less reliable compared to the bottom stripe because it has more of the yellow disks. So the same level of redundancy in the face of differently failing disks is either insufficient or overly wasteful. And usually it is the latter because these redundancy schemes are designed to be much more conservative and heavily overprotect the data. Let's take a look at how much does AFR vary across the different makes and models. So in this work, we looked at over 5.3 million disks and across 60 makes and models in three large development uh, deployed uh, deployment scenarios of NetApp, Google, and Backblaze. In this plot, each box represents 
disks of a make model, at least 10,000 of them. And on the y-axis plotted on log scale is the AFR of those different makes and models. And we can see that there's over 10 X difference between the weakest and the strongest disk. And this holds even within the same cluster. So not only does AFR vary across makes and models, but it also varies across a device's age. To show that I use the classic disk hazard curve or the bathtub curve, where we have the age of the disk on the x-axis and the AFR on the y-axis. At birth, the disk goes through high AFR in what is called as infancy or infant mortality. This is, file, this is followed by a low stable failure rate regime called useful life. And finally, we have the high AFR wear out phase. So the disk vary, AFR varies also as a function of disk age. Now today, the same redundancy scheme, the overly protective redundancy scheme is used throughout a disk's lifetime. So here the gray patch kind of shows what the redundancy scheme can tolerate. And we can see that all AFR variations are comfortably below the gray patch, meaning that all data is always sufficiently protected. In fact, overly protected. Let's call this scheme the R default scheme. The concept of disk adaptive redundancy is to identify the low stable failure rate regime of useful life and remove the excess redundancy and tailor the redundancy that you provide to the observed disk AFR. The idea is by having lower redundancy in lower AFR regions, we can get lower storage cost. So disk adaptive redundancy promises huge benefits. The first disk adaptive redundancy system was HART and it was published in Usenix Fast 2019. HART uh, was evaluated on reliability traces of, cluster, of a cluster with over 100,000 disks and provided substantial space savings compared to a one scheme fits all redundancy approach. Specifically, it provided up to 33% lesser space compared to three-way replication and 11 to 16% lesser space compared to popular erasure codes such as 6 of 9 and 10 of 14. Remember that in today's clusters, a 10% storage space savings translates to tens of thousands of fewer disks. It is in fact savings of millions, if not billions of dollars. So, Hart promised much lower storage cost and a significantly lower carbon footprint. So Hart was awesome, but there was a problem. Hart suffers from what we call transition overload. And here uh, is what transition overload means. So remember the bathtub curve and the tailored redundancy. What Hart did not account for is that these changes of, changes of redundancy at the end of infancy and the start of wear out do not come for free. They have a high IO cost associated with them. Moreover, when the redundancy is to be changed at the start of wear out, the AFR curve is on the rise. And if not acted promptly and urgently, the AFR might cross the tolerated region, rendering the data underprotected. So the high IO cost and the urgent transitions is what we call transition overload. And for that, we have pacemaker. So let's first look at how much does transition overload actually hurt. So here we have hard simulated on some Google clusters and the Backplex cluster. In this plot, I have the calendar date on the x-axis and on the right y-axis, the disk population, which is shown steadily increasing over time. The very left is the birth of the cluster. On the bottom graph, I have the same calendar date on the x-axis but on the left y-axis, I have the total transition IO per day as a, a fraction of the total clusters IO bandwidth. And I'm going to merge these two plots henceforth. And what we see is that for this particular Google cluster, there were weeks when all that the cluster was doing was simply changing redundancy schemes from one to another. So the 100% of the cluster IO bandwidth was being used only in changing redundancy schemes, which is in fact supposed to be a background activity. 
This is not just an artifact of this one cluster, but also seen in other Google clusters we looked at and the Backblaze cluster. Essentially, transition overload renders Heart useless in practice. To solve that, we have devised Pacemaker, which does the job of efficiently regulating the heart. So Pacemaker is published in OSDI 2020. It consists of three main components, a proactive transition initiator that helps transition, uh, that helps reduce the urgency of transitions and a redundancy planner that helps choose the right kind of schemes to transition to and an efficient transition executor that reduces the IO cost associated with the transitions. We'll look at each one of these in detail. Before doing that, I want to point out an interesting insight from our analysis, which are the two different deployment patterns. And we will show how Pacemaker had to tailor its solutions depending on the deployment pattern of the disks. So the first pattern we encountered was a disk population that slowly grew, grew over time and was uh, uh, involving a steady deployment of a few clusters, a few disks on uh, every day or on every few days. We call this the trickle deployment. In contrast, the step deployed disks are when tens of thousands of disks are deployed in a very short span of time, say a couple of weeks. And here you can see disk populations increasing like a step function. And we call this the step deployment. So for the transition, uh, proactive transitions, an important uh, well, like pacemaker has to understand what the AFR will be in the future. And therefore, it needs to have a confident understanding of the AFR it observes. In this video, what you're seeing is a trickle deployment, a trickle deployed make model. On the top plot is the AFR curve of the disks as it is forming. And on the bottom plot, we see the disk population slowly trickling in over time. As you notice, the leading edge of the blue curve is extremely jittery and it is going all over the place. This does not allow Pacemaker to get a robust estimate of what the AFR would be since it's changing all the time. And that is because that AFR estimate at the leading edge of the blue curve is based on statistically insignificant number of disks because they're trickling slowly over time. In order to tackle this, Pacemaker marks the first C disks as the canary disks. By default, it's the first 3,000 disks that are marked as canaries by a pacemaker. Remember that each make model has tens of thousands of disks. So the first 3,000 are in fact a very small percentage of that make model. And pacemaker learns the AFR curve by just observing these C canary disks, but not optimizing the redundancy for them. After having learned the AFR curve, from these canary disks, Pacemaker then applies the learned knowledge to the bulk of the disks that are following the canary disks. In this way, Pacemaker exercises caution not to react to quickly changing AFR uh, curves in trickle transitions, but takes its time to learn the curve and then apply a robust understanding. This helps uh, proactively transition trickle deployed disks. For step deployment, although this the problem is different. Remember that if we take the first few days worth of disks as canaries, in step deployment, that would essentially mean most, if not all of the disks. And since Pacemaker does not optimize for canary disks, this would mean not optimizing for a bulk of, of the, all the step deployed disks. Instead, what we observe is that for step deployed disks, the mere fact that the disks are deployed in very large population allows us to get a robust AFR estimate of the disks from the get-go. In this plot, you can see that in contrast to the trickle deployed AFR curve, this AFR curve is very well behaved from even at the leading edge. And this is because its estimate is based on a very large population that you can see below. This statistically highly accurate AFR estimates combined with another observation that AFRs rise slowly over time and not uh, very quickly 
allows pacemaker to design an early warning system that takes into account these robust AFR estimates and slowly growing curve. And so when the AFR starts rising towards wear out, a uh, pacemaker can essentially threshold the AFR at a certain value and understand the slope at which the AFR is rising and predict where the AFR will be 30 or 60 days from a particular date and accordingly proactively start transitioning disks into the more safer redundancy schemes to avoid data loss. Now, we saw the transition initiator. Now let's look at the redundancy planner. In Pacemaker, we have a constraint-driven engine that decides which redundancy scheme to use during a disk's useful life. There are certain static, static constraints like the target reliability that the uh, scheme should meet or the maximum number of uh, amount of reconstruction IO that is tolerated. And these five constraints are the same as HART, the previous system, disk adaptive redundancy system, uh, and are constructed carefully by talking to disk uh, administrators. In addition, there are two IO specific constraints that we add for pacemaker. The first is an average IO constraint. This, this constraint specifically says, in the entire lifetime of the disk, what is the average IO that can be used for performing redundancy transitions? By default, it is set to 1%, meaning that one per, more not, not more than 1% of the IO on average over the lifetime of the disk will be used for doing redundancy transitions. The other constraint is what we call the peak IO constraint, which means whenever the IO transitions start, the redundancy transitions start, what is the cap at which those transitions can proceed? And by default, it's 5%. By bounding the peak IO and the average IO, we essentially limit the total transition overload that can uh, that is observed by pacemaker in practice. Finally, let's look at how the transition executor reduces the transition IO. So for trickle deployments, remember that whenever disks trickle in a few at a time, they will also depart a few at a time and require transition into wear out a few at a time. At such times, rather than the traditional read, re-encode and write, which is very expensive whenever a disk departs, we simply copy the data over of the disk that is departing, empty the disk and only transition an empty disk. This is K1 times cheaper in terms of IO cost compared to read, re-encode and write. For step deployments though, since all of the disks are going to transition together, we have a second type of efficient transition where all of the data is assumed to transition together. Instead of moving any data around, we simply recalculate the data, uh, recalculate the parities using the new Stripe configuration, leaving the data as it is and mark the disk as transition into the new scheme. This is also significantly cheaper than the read, re-encode and write. In this way, transition executor reduces the total IO cost associated with transitions. We also observe another important thing, which is that practical backup curves are actually very different from idealized ones. And their useful life isn't quite as flat as we uh, observe in, in our textbook examples. In fact, we see a kind of a curved bar tub where the AFR curve is slowly growing over time. So we revise the idealized bar tub curve to a tilted bar tub curve. And for disk adaptive redundancy, what that means is pacemaker enables multiple transitions during a disk's useful life. Each one is called a phase of useful life. So now let's look at how pacemaker performs in practice. Here we have the cluster that had really high IO transition overload. And with pacemakers optimized techniques, it is able to completely chop down all the transition overload. And in fact, the average IO overload required was only 0.3% of the cluster's IO bandwidth, and it was always capped at 
And in terms of the space savings achieved, we can see that this on the very left in the bottom plot, we have the six of nine default redundancy scheme, but as this transition into more optimized schemes, as is seen in that plot above, uh, which shows the transition IO, the pacemaker is able to use the more optimized schemes, allowing over 14% average space savings. And in the peak, about 25% space savings, which amounts to 75,000 fewer disks. This is true also in terms of other Google clusters that we observed, and also in the open source Backblaze cluster, which is only trickle deployed. So Pacemaker, although is fantastic in the way it works, I'd also like to go ahead and talk about some pitfalls of Pacemaker, which is the motivation for our next work. So Pacemaker essentially puts an additional placement restriction on data. So all stripes must be allocated within a certain R group, meaning disks that have similar failure rates. Moreover, because we have this R group placement constrict restriction, that means that stripes have lower risk diversity since an R group contains of a step and a step is made up of typically the same make model and they can the disks of a same make model are susceptible to manufacturing defects and bulk failures. Finally, pacemaker forces an all or nothing approach of disk adaptive redundancy, and which is in contrast to currently employed uh, file-based redundancy approaches. These three pitfalls of pacemaker are motivation for our next work, which is Tiger, disk adaptive redundancy without placement restrictions. And this work is about to be presented in OSTI 2022 in July. In conclusion, I'd like to say that disk adaptive redundancy such as systems such as HART suffer from transition overload. Pacemaker is an IO efficient disk adaptive redundancy orchestrator that uses very little IO bandwidth, which is also capped and provides significant space savings for millions of dollars worth of savings. Pacemaker is uh, designed based on real world failure analysis of millions of disks from actual deployments. We in fact also worked on a prototype of Pacemaker and in HDFS, and I couldn't go into that because of a uh, uh, shortage of time, but I request you to read the paper and take a look at our GitHub repo. Here's my email address if you want to contact for uh, feedback or any questions. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very nice talk. Uh, question, you. when you consider, ha have you taken into account the uh, redundancy is often used also to deal with failures in servers, failures in networking, failures in data centers, and not just disk failures? And how does that impact your results? Uh, that's a great question. So for this work, we have not really considered anything other than disk failures. So we were looking right now only at disk failures. And when, when we look at a stripe, we're only considering chunks where all chunks of a stripe belong to different disks and disks as individual components and that can fail. But um, the principles of this work are applicable to any granularity so long as you have enough uh, population to kind of make a uh, robust AFR estimate. You can use it for analyzing server failures, network failures, uh, or any other component like SSDs also, but we have not considered that in our work. Uh, interesting talk. Is it clear that it is best to have same AFR disks in each uh, cluster, or may it actually be better to have you know, one lesser disk and, and the others better ones? I haven't thought about it, but I'm not sure which is better. So uh, it's uh, in a couple of weeks' time, you should. In more like three weeks, you should be able to uh, hear our work on Tiger. Uh, 
which is our next uh, disk adaptive redundancy system, which is more generalized, which allows for you to have disks of different AFRs and combine them arbitrarily. But to answer your point, I don't think there is a particular better. In a sense, if you have disks of the same AFR, you could optimize all of those together and the overall space usage will be really low when all of them are in useful life. Having said that, there could be scenarios when if those same AFR disks belong to the same make model, that they can lend themselves to bulk failures because of manufacturing issues or other such correlated uh, uh, events. Um, and, and from a risk diversity perspective, it is actually probably better to have disks of different AFRs, meaning different make models together. Um, and now with Tiger, you will be able to combine the low AFR disks and the high AFR disks in one stripe. And that will allow for more flexible placement and still get the kind of savings we are looking at in Pacemaker. Okay, thank All right. you. All right, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.